Evolution has reached a state where it has self-actualized. It has an active agent, which is us, to control its evolution and other evolution. Humans have a unique ability to actually plan beyond their own lifespan. There is an awesome power and therefore an awesome responsibility with the, the ability to add a genome. It has not been easy to study chromosomes. Human chromosomes are extremely small. Up until 2001, we really were living in a mostly black box as to what happens inside of our DNA and our genes. And so it's important to study the human genome and human DNA and its changes because this tells us the roadmap for what we can fix and even defend against on other worlds. Biological engineering is just like when you think of engineering for pipes or for plumbing. It's just here we're doing it with DNA and with other molecules that make life. We're really surrounded by this very large catalog of mysterious organisms that are all around us and in us. We've actually found that on any given surface that you touch, half of the DNA is of unknown origin. Given what we've seen on Earth, the most likely life that we'll find on other planets would be very small, very like, much like a bacteria or an archaea. And they're real survivors, they can survive anywhere. So I think we'll see something similar if we were to find life on other worlds. My name is Christopher Mason. I'm a geneticist at Weill Cornell Medicine. We develop new biochemical and computational methods to understand DNA and prepare it essentially for long-term missions in space. If you send you know, people out into space, the big challenge is the radiation, the stress on the body, and if you send people for long, long-term missions, you basically have to tell them, uh, you know, good luck and hopefully you survive, or you have to defend them as many ways as you can, both technologically with sort of surrounding the defenses, say for electromagnetic radiation or physical shielding, but also genetically. I think there is a, a, an idea and even a duty to protect them as many ways as we can. NASA has just launched a large initiative to sequence anything that's been grown on the space station or cultured or brought back to Earth to get a complete catalog of what's changed when you've been in space as a bacteria. These are some of the samples basically uh, that had come from space and then we made uh, cDNA or actually converted them into a way that we could sequence the DNA. So this is actually, uh, some of these came from space. You never know what we'll find out there in space, but if we find something that's really dangerous, we may have to think about uh, ideas to defend ourselves, not just physically or electrochemically, but even genetically against some invasive species, which could potentially mean engineering the human genome itself. We've seen from preliminary studies that bacteria evolve on space and even become more resistant to antibiotics. Much like we can track them in the subways and the cities in the world, we can track antibiotic resistance and how it moves. And so this means that as things evolve on the space station and bacteria move between astronauts, they actually kind of represent the first evolving alien life in the sense that it's off this planet. There are many challenges to going to another planet. We have to think about sort of the, the human body's response to different pressures, temperatures. So we have to think everything about how you stand, how you breathe, how the body works, even in that environment. We just completed the longest monitoring and profiling of a human being, both on Earth and in space, actually. So this was the uh, Kelly twins, Mark and Scott Kelly, where Scott Kelly was in space for a full year, and we monitored what happened to his body, both of the DNA, RNA, protein, metabolite level, everything we could possibly measure about the human body in space and on Earth with a twin. We actually switched the name tag. <laughs> These represent the first snapshots and first kind of molecular clues as what happens to the human body when you're in space. 
We could already see from some work that the telomeres actually got longer in space, and so it seems there's a little bit of a fountain of youth in space, uh, at least at the telomere level. And we could also see that many genes, thousands of genes, were changing their expression, and we're narrowing those down into what are the space-specific genes uh, that happen in the human body when you're in space. As we go out and explore, both you know, in these other worlds, but also within our own body and the mysteries of the human genome and, and start to think about ways to protect it, it is likely going to be a partnership between our engineering, uh, physical engineering and our biological engineering to get there safely and to respond. As an example of what we could think about for engineering genomes or our genome is what we've already started doing with mosquitoes. Essentially, you can use a gene drive that is an autonomous genetic element that goes in and makes copies of itself and actually then propagates through the population of a species like mosquitoes to get rid of their ability to carry, say, malaria or to carry Zika virus or other viruses that you want them to just not be able to carry them. This is uh, something we're doing today to defend ourselves against really a dangerous species that is all around us. Some of the big concerns that if, if genome editing and genome engineering and biological engineering, if it's so easy, you could make sure that you only have male instead of female babies, that you have different color eye, skin, or hair color, and that you essentially have a neo-eugenics. Technology can always be used for both good or evil, but the chart of human history uh, has bent towards justice, as Dr. King has said. We have, of course, had awful uses of technology, but uh, writ large, life expectancy is longer, humanity is in a better condition than we've ever been in. So it has to be done slowly, carefully, with as many controls as possible. But it is, to some degree, our eventual duty as a species that controls our own evolution. There is an innate curiosity, I think, in all of us, uh, from when we're toddlers, when you wander around and explore. And the, there is always, I think, an instinct in most people for something mysterious and something unknown. And this is really part of humanity. We've been doing it for as long as we've been humans. And so I think this is uh, something that is part of our nature. Would you live on another planet? Sure, yeah. Um, I would go tomorrow. I would go and live on another planet. And, and if you think about it, it could be scary. It could be a one-way trip. But the, when people came across the Atlantic to settle here in the United States, it was a one-way trip. Granted, there was an atmosphere, so it was a little bit easier. But they came uh, and ex as explorers, as fearless you know, humans, saying, I want to go and build a new life, build a new world.